today we're in the middle of this Hall of Fame series. Now let me just explain it again. There's a couple different things. I'm not saying that every one of these people, um, these people are on for different reasons. Some of them, like the one today, are here because largely they help create the kind of world that we live in. And today, the person we're talking about is Adam Smith. Some of you might know that name. He was born in 1723. His dad died two months before he was born. And through most of his young adult life, he considered pursuing ministry. And went to school with that in mind, but ended up choosing philosophy instead. He became a professor and lectured most of his adult life at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, his famous book that probably a lot of people have heard of is called The Wealth of Nations. And it literally started the field of economics. And it was well known and read by people we might be aware of, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and others. Here's what, here's what gets forgotten, and what I'm spending just a little bit of time on today is before he ever wrote the book, Wealth of Nations, he wrote a book called The Moral Sentiments, which explains the undergirding of a lot of his philosophy, which talked about morality and beliefs and the life that should support our economic endeavors. I'm reading now the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 31. It's a passage that you know very, very well. You've heard it numerous times in your life. It's a good one. And it says this. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Boy, we live in a world that's dominated by capitalism. I don't need to tell you that. We live in a capitalist system. But for the past 80 years, for the first time in human history, we've lived in a capitalist world. And in the last 32 years, almost entirely in a capitalist world, with a few notable exceptions. So I say that, it's a, capitalism is this system that's based on private ownership of goods and the means of production and operating them for profit. And so people are allowed to accumulate capital, markets are competitive, you're allowed to go into business to compete with somebody else, um, you're allowed to set the price for that, you're allowed to own private property, we recognize property rights, and the voluntary exchange of money and labor. That's kind of an important thing to think about. In essence, this is the boring part, but in essence, you have the freedom to choose. Up until relatively re recently in human history, if your father was a printer, guess what you're going to be? If your father was a farmer, guess what you're going to be? It was determined for you. This idea that all of us, most of us here have had when we're four years old and the parent asks us, what do you want to be when you grow up? We have this freedom to think about the different things we'd rather be. And probably all of you went, I want to be this. And then you got older, you went to college, I'm going to be that. And then 15 years after college, you're not doing anything that you went to college for. Your degree does this and you went this way. And no one's stopping you. In fact, this is a strange time. I don't know about you, but everywhere I go to, and I was a lot of places this week. I was back in Ohio this week and here. And no matter what store I went into, regardless of what restaurant I went into or business that I drove past, it seemingly every single one of them had help wanted signs in the window. What we have to admit is this freedom has succeeded spectacularly in ways we couldn't possibly have imagined. About 15 years ago, and my timing might be off, I'd have to go back, uh, the chairman of Apple Computer 
said, what I want to do is, is I'm going to take put this cell phone that everybody's invented, and I want to turn it into a personal computer that you have in your pocket, and everybody mocked him. I could pull the old newspaper articles out, and every one of us has one of these in the pocket now. I went to, a, just went by a garage sale in our neighborhood, and this guy had he probably had 10 big, thick road atlases he was selling for a buck. Now, I'm one of these weird people. I don't care if I have them. A road atlas for a buck? Yes. The reason why they're selling them for a buck is everybody pulls this out of their pocket now and turns it on. Here's why it succeeded. In the 1960s, the average home was about was was 1247 square feet. Today the average new home is 2500 and some square feet. Double. Remember the average home had all these bright colors, paneling, shag carpeting and featured one gigantic TV. The screen wasn't gigantic. The TV was gigantic. It was a big brown box. And it would say something like on the edge, genuine imitation wood grain. And the screen was about this big. And you had three channels. Four if you're lucky. Five or six if you live in Chicago. But in northern Ohio, three. Today... In a spectacular reversal, we are back to black and white. All the new homes are gray. Everything is gray. We have multiple TVs, which are either very, very small or very, very big. Nothing in between. And they're about one-tenth the weight the old ones used to be. Instead of sitting on the floor, we hang them on the wall. They're much cheaper. Average home, I said before, is doubled in size. Even the poorest homes have refrigerators, air conditioners, and TVs, and often multiple. For this, oh, I can go on. Some of us are old enough to remember at the end of the day in high school, we'd all run out to our cars in the parking lot. And we'd have to take the lid off the carburetor and spray the ether into it because it wouldn't start. And as long as somebody had a can, we tossed the can around the parking lot until everybody's car started. And now people look at you and say, tell me more, Grandpa, what's a carburetor? For this, we thank Adam Smith. I remember watching Star Trek when I was a kid. And they'd go down the hallway of the spaceship and they'd turn and the door would just open for them. And I would go, oh, like that's even possible. And now every store we go in, a similar thing happens. So we live in this world, and even though things have gotten pretty big, we all still struggle with this concept of money. And if you can't read it, it says, here's my financial status. I just rinsed off a paper plate. We worry about it. We pray for it. It's hard to live without. We struggle with it. It might be hard to live with it. And if we have it, we worry about, we worry about losing it. When we don't have it, we worry about getting it. <laughs> and when we have some, we worry about losing it. And we have an idea in our head that if I could just get this amount in the bank, boy, I'll have it made. And then you get past that point, and then you think, wow, if it goes back down to a certain amount, then I'll never be able to sleep at night. And it seems to dominate our lives in a lot of different ways. And collectively, we have issues with money. And the last year has just been a sparkling example of this. A year ago, remember a year ago? For some inexplicable reason, the first thing everybody thought about when the COVID shutdown started, I must have six months worth of toilet paper in my house. And it was months before the great toilet paper shortage of 2020 was rectified. We hoarded it. 
On the opposite end of hoarding, we have some that pursue lavish lifestyles that focus only on their own desires. I can't remember the dessert. I want to say it was a cupcake or something. There's some restaurant in New York that has a cupcake that has some gold dust in the icing. And for like $2,000, you can get the cupcake. What is wrong with people? Some have a lot. Others have a little. Some have more. Some have less. And the system, capitalism, gets blamed. And even today, we have a lot of people holding up as models places where everyone has nothing. And holding it up as a model. I don't understand that at all. My question is, what are we to think? How are we to act? Look at what selfish old Adam Smith conceived. Or was he as selfish as he gets blamed for? That's, why don't at least look at that today. Here's some things that Adam Smith said. And what he said, I think, surprises a lot of different people. He said this, he said, gradually, as we grow from childhood to adulthood, we each learn what is and is not acceptable to other people and what benefits other people and what doesn't benefit other people. And morality stems from our social nature. And so by following our conscience, we end up promoting the happiness of mankind. But we have to follow our conscience. Human laws may aim at the same results, but they can never be as consistent, immediate, or effective as conscience and the rules of, mor the rules of morality engineered by nature and its God. That's a different thing that I think we often hear about. What he says is, freedom is a sure guide to a good world than the supposed expertise of every visionary and every single law that they ever want to put into place. Some of you remember what life was like in 1973 and 74. We had inflation. I hope we're not on the same path now. But if you remember, one of the ways they decided to combat that is they, would, they imposed price controls. And they said... If you want to sell an 8-ounce piece of meat, here's how much it has to cost. So you know what they then did? They immediately started cutting meat in 7-ounce size. Because there's no law for 8-ounce. And when they catch the law, then they make it different. Everybody was just a step ahead. They changed the size of boxes and sizes of cans. And it was this continuous thing to stay ahead of everything. Sometimes there's a word that some of us have heard with capitalism. It's called the invisible hand. And we think it's just all the economic decisions, but it actually comes from this book, Moral Sentiments, where he said the invisible hand is actually the moral decisions that people are making. And as they make righteous moral decisions, that's the hand that makes everything better. Not just whatever spending thing comes into play, but people acting morally and rightly. The love of virtue is the noblest and best passion in human nature. And this is Adam Smith. Virtue and righteousness improve economies individually and collectively. I'm back to a very simple statement. When we make good decisions, when we make righteous decisions... Life improves because of that. My life improves. The people around me, hopefully, their life improves. The man who acts completely and solely from a concern for what is right and what is fit to be done, a concern for what is proper, acts from the most sublime and godly motive there is. Now, some of you, I grew up in this very conservative home. Some of you grew up in a home like mine. When I was a teen, 
I was not allowed to go to dances. Wasn't brokenhearted about it. If you ever see me try to dance, that was probably a good thing. It was good that I don't do it. It's a public safety issue if I try to dance. And I wasn't allowed. And sometime I was sitting there at church once and one teen asked the youth pastor, why shouldn't we go to a dance? And he says, well, let me tell you why. Because you'll be dancing to school dance and you'll grab the girl and you'll do a slow dance and they'll play a certain song and your mind will be full of an impure thought. And I thought, I'm 15 years old. I don't need a school dance to have an impure thought. <laughs> Sorry. Those kind of run on a roll, on a scroll. In my mind, I'm 15. Do you understand what being 15 is? And so that's what I was told. You know, you'll, you'll do this and you'll have all these thoughts. And then I got a little older and I actually... <clears throat> look something up once. And that all sprung from a certain time in history. And that rule came in, that expectation came in back to when, if you wanted to go dance, there was only two places to go. The first place is you could go to the saloon and you had girls you paid to dance with you. And if you paid a little more, the dance would continue, but we won't talk about that. The other place you would go is these high society balls, top coat and tails and spats and all that kind of thing and elegant gowns and they were actually really big deals. You go, what? And people were very formal and it was very proper. Well, what on earth's wrong with that? Are you ready? It was an economic argument. With so many people needing things, if there's so many hungry in the world, how could God's people spend that kind of money just to go to a dance when their neighbor's going without food? See, that was the moral. That was the virtuous. That was the godly thing that even Adam Smith was talking about so many years ago. Economics. We need to think through some of the things that we do. I was looking this week, just on the other day, had the computer open, looking out west, you know, and thinking about maybe in September going out to Yellowstone or something. And I was coming across these little places, and then, then I looked at this other place, and oh, that looks nice. Those cabins look nice. I wonder how much it is. $2,000. Well, it was one of those high-end ranches with spa and all this other stuff, and uh, no. Part of my economic decision is I can't justify some things. We, we live and we buy and we save and we invest in this real world. And hopefully somewhere in there, in our economic life, we're driven by two factors. One is a concern for other people. And the second is a daily pursuit of what God would have us do. Oh, we know all about some moral things. We know about, oh, I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that. But we don't think about what drives our daily decisions. We should always act for the best interests of others. Our, <coughs> excuse me, our conscience and the guiding of the Holy Spirit should impact our economics. I think about some of the things, some of, I'm not talking about just some of the things um, I can always tell. Sometimes I go into a gas station, I'm just buying gas, and maybe the pump won't work and you got to go in and pay, and you go in and the line at the cashier is eight deep. And I know, oh my goodness, what's the Powerball money up to this week? Do some quick math. Do like two tickets twice a week times 52 times 10 years. Just do some quick math and see where you're at. 
There are some things that we do that seem like such a little thing. You do that math to them, and all of a sudden, it gets to be a pretty big thing. Sometimes making conscience, conscious, righteous decisions on your daily life pays a premium and, and, and pays off throughout the rest of your life. If I allow God to guide my financial decisions, how would my life look different? That's a good question. What habits would disappear? And I'm not talking about all that you need to disappear because they're icky and they're bad and you're bad if you do them. I'm not talking about from that perspective. What good are you not allowing into your life? What blessing can be possible if you let God govern every decision? The question might not be, what do I want? Maybe another question is, what good can I do? What other economy can I help? Let me tell you something that happened this summer, and I, sorry, this winter, I won't attach uh, any name to it. You know, a lot of Christmases, a lot of us, we make an announcement and we give, and we usually divide it up between maybe two or three um, pastors, families, in one of these little churches, the churches run 20 or 30 people. And the pastor is there because he's serving and he doesn't really get any pay. And so we say, here's $800 or here's $1,000. Merry Christmas. We notice you and thankful for your ministry. And we do that. And it's, it's one of the best things that we do. It really is one of the best things that we do. In the middle of that, someone sent me an email. And said, uh, look in your email. I just sent you an email and use this for the Christmas thing. And about 10 minutes later, it came in my email. Someone sent me a $1,000 Amazon gift card. What did I do with it? I called about seven young pastors on the young pastors. And I said... Let me ask you a question. Are there books that you've been wanting to have, but you just can't afford it? And they said, yes. I said, you have $150 to spend. Email me those books. And in addition to that, there were seven pastors that we bought books for. Um, that's what can happen in God's economy when we act in a holy and righteous way. I suppose I learned that very early in life. Some of us recently in the last year, there was a time we were looking for local businesses to support in the early days of our response to the pandemic because there was a lot of government action seemingly geared toward destroying the businesses, businesses and lives of a, lot of, of a lot of people. And so we we're trying to find little mom and pop shops to support because the chain will survive. We're trying to find, you know, other people. And I know I've told this story before, so again, I apologize for those of you that have heard it. But I was about in high school, and uh, I don't remember exactly what year. I do remember that it was during the playoffs, and there was an NFL playoff game going on. So it was probably January-ish, and my grandmother was still driving at that time, and she came in because I was watching it at her house because our TV in my house had this thing it would sporadically not work, and it was seemingly geared to the importance of the sport game that was on that day. The more important the game, the more likely it was that that TV wouldn't work. And this was the playoffs, and it wasn't working. So I ran over to, grand to my grandma's house, and which was next door, and I was watching on her TV, and she goes, I'm going to go to the store. I'll be right back. And she got back. She was only gone about 15 minutes. And she stopped at the door, and she had that I want to tell you a story look in her face. So I, tur I turned the TV down. Wait a minute. I didn't do that. I had to get up and walk four steps and turn it down. The suffering we had to do in the older days. And she said, you know, I went to the store with my list. And here is what was on my list. 
And I was thinking, okay, is this going somewhere? I was smiling. I was pleasant, but in my head, I was trying to speed her up. And she said, and then I saw there were bananas on sale. And I still remember what she said. I know you probably can't do it now, but back then she goes, they were 39 cents a pound. And it just seemed like such a good price. Okay. Again, Grandma, is this going somewhere? Again, I didn't say that. Because when you talk to your grandmother like that, there's a cold corner in hell just for you. And she said, it wasn't on my list. So I said a prayer. God, is it okay if I get these bananas? And I was thinking, you can handle this decision, Grandma. Do you really have to bother God with the banana question? That's what I was thinking. Again, you don't say that. Because I'm back that cold corner again. But what she taught me in that moment was there was almost nothing outside of her daily life that she wanted to do outside of the Lord's presence and direction. And can I tell you, she was far more right than I was. Our desire for honor, our desire for righteousness, our desire for holiness should be higher than our desire for wealth and our desire for savings. Now again, sometimes we'll make good decisions and some of those things will happen. I think there's some truth to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And sometimes as a result of that, all these things are added to you as well. We have a world that tells us if you're greedy enough, you'll get wealthy. And I'm here to tell you greed is something that deters wealth. It doesn't create it. Adam Smith said that acting from virtue Acting from a desire for righteousness is a godly motivation that improves the economy. Our thoughts should reflect God. Our words should reflect God. Our choices should reflect God. Our economic life should reflect God as well. Who said that? The gospel writers. And 300 years ago, a guy named Adam Smith said that as well. It might be good to follow that advice.